right now. We shouldn't be rejoicing in this place today, but because we have a hope through Jesus Christ. Amen.
want you to just, just say, talk to him however you want, but ask him to speak to your heart today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I love you today. I thank you for being my best friend. God, the smile that I have today is yours. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I was miserable without you. God, and I know today that you have come into my life. And all of my friends that are here today, God, family that's here today, your children, God, wherever they're at, whatever their battle they're facing, they may not even know you right now. They may not even talk to you right now. But I'm praying, Lord, that by the end of this, God, we're going to know your love so much better. God, we're going to know how to fill your presence. I simply pray that these lips, God, that they would be your words, not Jim Davis, but your words, Lord. And God, in every heart and soul that's in this house today, let it give you glory. In Jesus' wonderful name, and the church says, Amen. 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 Look at your neighbor and simply go with these words, and then we'll be seated. It says, is nothing, nothing to, to lose. lose. Nothing to lose. And you may be seated. When we see that the first, first verse that we have today... The word trying. When we go into actually, let's see, but let, let's go to verse 2 if you want, Sister Davis. But my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse, tempt diverse temptations. Go ahead to verse 3. Amen. Verse 3 says, knowing this, that the trying, now what does the word trying mean? It means to be proven. The trying, the pushing, the thing that we didn't like in school. I didn't like test in school, probably because I didn't do well at it. But one thing I find is in life that I can do well at these tests. So he said, knowing this, that the testing of your faith. What, what do we find that faith is? Faith is our belief in God. Amen? So we're testing. Here's what happens. You're going to be put in situations that's going to test you in how much you really believe in God. Everybody say that with me. Test me in how much I believe in God. And this is what happens in your life. Why do the trials come? Why do the problems come the way that they come? Because you're being tested in that very thing. Well, let's, well, let's read on. Trying of your faith worketh. Now, what does the word worketh mean? It means that when you go through these, it's going to accomplish. Amen? The Lord doesn't leave a job done half-hearted. Do you know that trial that you're in is going to bring you to a place? When you're ready to come out of that trial, when, you, when your faith is going to be whole, you won't come out of that trial until your faith becomes to that place. So you're tired about all that? I'm telling you, you it's because God's taking you to a certain place. And here's what we read on to say. Faith, work, and patience. And patience means this. Not swerved, but endurance and steadfast. It means that if I'm walking this way right here, and something, there's a rock in my path, it means that in life, whenever I'm walking along, that problems are going to come. They're going to hit every one of us. They're going to come straight at us. But instead of swerving off path to go around this snake or this, this problem or this, this bill, this marital problem, I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm going to at least keep walking straight on. And God's going to take care of it. Amen? Amen. Today we're going to walk in that path. Amen? We're, 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 I, I'm starting this off there, but we're going, to, we're going to come around and have fun today. Amen? Is that all right? Every one of us go through life when we have bad days. Anybody ever have any bad days? But have you ever felt like you've had bad weeks? Have you ever felt like you had bad months? Have you ever felt like you had bad years? Well, I just want to make sure I'm not the only one in here today that felt like that. Sometimes we go through situations and trials and have bad times. One person said it like this. They say, you know you're having a bad day when your horn sticks on the freeway behind 32 Hells Angels motorcycle bike. Those bikes are out there. You know you're having a bad day when your horn sticks behind it. You know you're having a bad day whenever your income tax check, that refund that you get, the check bounces. You know you're having a bad day. And that's possible in this good economy. Hey, Amen. It's possible for us to have it. They say, you know you're having a bad day when the bird's singing outside your window. It's a vulture. <laughs> you know you're having a bad day when the bird singing outside your window in the morning is a vulture. Here's what they say. You know you're having a bad day when you put both contacts into the same eye. Never done that. But I will tell you this. I, I didn't know if I would admit this or not yesterday. I, I, I don't know. I was completely out of it yesterday. And I haven't been feeling well this morning. Thank God he's already he's giving me strength today. Amen. But I was I went over to get, to get up with old brother Barrett and have breakfast on on Saturday, and we, we went out, and, and but when I got up, I'm getting up, and I'm putting on my clothes, because I knew we were going to be going to a conference after that, and I'm putting my belt on, and all of a sudden, I come around, and I said, what in the world is this button doing in the back of my pants? And I had put my pants on backwards. <laughs>
borrow from your Visa to pay your MasterCard. I've been down there. Anybody ever been there? Oh. Uh, okay, all right. I know I got some witnesses in here today. Maybe I know the Lord has put me on track today. You call your spouse and, and spouse and tell them you would like to eat out tonight. And when you get home, you find your sandwich sitting on the front porch. And sometimes you have those bad days. Is that all right, Brother Barrett? Yes, sir. There was a late young mother one day that was having a terrible, terrible day. And uh, she was she was at the house and, and working, in the, and, and she received a call. And on the other end of the call, it said this, well, how, how, how are you doing, darling? She said, oh, you wouldn't believe I'm having a terrible day. He said, everything is falling apart. She said, well, what happened? And she began to go through the list of the things that happened to them. She said, the baby won't eat today. And she said, then the, the washing machine broke down. And then and I, and I was supposed to go shopping to have uh, supper for dinner tonight, food for dinner tonight. And I wasn't able to go shopping. And she said, then I twisted my ankle. And she said, and I'm just having a terrible, terrible, terrible day. And, and, and I'm supposed to have a couple that's supposed to come over tonight and have dinner with my husband and I. And she said, oh, honey, she said, just calm down. She said, I'm going to come over to the house and I'll take care of the baby and I'll, and I'll call the repairman to fix the washer and I'll, I'll clean your house up. I know you said it was a mess. I'll clean your house up. I'll, I'll do everything that needs to be done. And she said, don't even worry about it. I'm going to, she said, I'll call in the repairman. And she said, I'll even call George and tell him just that he needs to come home from work early. You're having a bad day. And the housewife, the young mother on the other end of the line said, wait a minute, George. She said, who's George? She said, honey, you know who George is. That's your husband. And she said, no, that's not. She said, is this the number? 223-1374? Two, two, three, three, she said, no, it's not. It's 322-1374. Three, two, two, three, she said, oh, I must have the wrong number. And then the housewife falls on the other end. Does that mean you're not coming over to help? <laughs> Why am I saying that? Because sometimes we feel like we're going through trials in our life. And there's no help to be found. We feel that we're in the middle of a, of a crisis. And what, God, where are my prayers going? God, what, what, what's going on in this situation that I'm in? Why is everything falling apart? But today, I want you to rest with this comfort in your heart that God has a plan in your life. And what we go through many times is simply this thing. By the trying of your faith, come on. By the trying of your faith, God is putting you to a place where you're going to be wanting for nothing, where, you're, where your spirit's going to be made perfect because you're going through these trials. God has put you in a place where you're going to be able to walk differently. Amen? How, how many agree with me on that today? Amen. God works in our life, in our situations. Tough times will come in our life. Amen? Tough times will come. If you've ever had a tough time, just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I'm looking for somebody that I would go over and sit by Janae. She doesn't have her hand. Right? Janae, how do you go through life with no tough time, baby? <laughs> I want to know how you go through. But every one of us have tough times. If you would have looked, it would have been unanimous almost across this place that we all go through tough times. Why? Because we are not born in a perfect sense. We're born having struggles. If you haven't had any struggles, let me talk to you for a little bit. You'll probably see that there's some, there's some struggles that we have. Why is it that we go through those? Because I believe the Lord cares about us and He wants us to bring us to a place of perfect faith in Him. Amen? Amen. There are some times in your life where you will come through situations where that you will feel like that it's all done and over. That, that the last words have been said. That the song has been sung. That the, 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 the sun is setting on your day. That everything is falling apart. There's times in your life where you will come and you will feel like that you've lost it all. And there's some times where you will lose it all. But I want to, again, remind you today that God has a place and a part in your life. Do you understand the trial that you're in will not kill you? You're saying, what do you mean, Pastor? It will, you feel like you're going to in your situation. But do you realize that that trial was made for you? For the perfecting of your faith? Amen. Do you realize that trial that you're in? was to show you that you're standing on a shaky foundation? The thing that you've been facing was to show you? Because if that wasn't the case, then when trials come, we would have no worries. We would be wanting for nothing. We wouldn't want to ask anybody to move that boulder of the finances out of our road. We wouldn't be turned aside. We, we would continue on diligently towards that direction. What I'm talking about is that patience, not turning aside. God puts things in our life which will allow us. Sometimes we get tired. We say, man, it, Pastor, it seems like all I go through in life and it, and it breaks down and it falls apart and then I'm restarting all over again and I'm restarting all over again. Well, I heard one man say like this. He said, if you're tired of restarting in your life, why don't you stop quitting? Amen. Amen. 
why don't you stop quitting if you're tired of restarting over? Because what happens when God brings us through a place, you know that boulder was put in your path to show you that God moves boulders? But too many times we say it's something trying to slow me down. You know that finances are always short because God wants you to know that He's a provider? Do you know that sickness may come, that we know that His stripes are healing stripes? Amen. Do we know that the reason why we go through things and we feel weak is because He wants you to know how powerful the Holy Ghost is in your life? Do you know that we, if without the trials, without the problems, we would never get to that place where we would know what He wanted us to do? In the scripture, we are the Bible is laced with people just throughout that are always faced with trial. Every person in there, nobody was born with a golden spoon in his mouth. Solomon, who was who was righteous with God, it didn't mean he still had his problems. David was a man of faith, a man after God's own heart, but yet he had problems. And what would make us any different but that we would have problems? Do you know that's the one thing that we have in common? We do have problems. We do have trials. But we also have another. That we have a Savior that's already made a way through your trials. He's already talked about it. He's for you in your heart. He's led you in that battle. And some may be saying today, Pastor, I have fought this battle for some time. And I know what you're saying, but it's hard for me to believe. I promise you, if you don't quit this time, he'll bring you through. He'll bring you through. He'll bring you through. But it's letting God move in that. One man that sticks out of my mind to face some trials. And I have to ask my question in all genuineness. Would I be able to fight this battle that he fought? Paul was a man that fought the fight. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you, if you have your Bible, this is something you're going to want to look at. Amen. This is something that's going to give you some strength, I believe. I want to minister today. I'm being mindful of the time, but I want to minister the word. I do not want to forsake what God's given me. And I want to place it in our hands today that we're able to leave and be fed off of this. Amen. And after that, we got, we're going to be doing a baptism after service too. Amen. 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 Be good. The verse says this. Are they ministers of Christ? He was thinking about some people that spoke against him. That what it was going to be like to serve the Lord. What, it, what, what he was going to face. And we understand that Paul was kind of a, a rugged man. He persecuted Christians. He was, a, he was the bad dude. So he came in and it was bad. Because then when he left them, he left the, the people that he was with. They hated him. But then the church said, wait a minute, he's been killing us. And they didn't like him either. He was stuck without a friend. And he come to a place. And I'm going to tell you, when God brings you, it ain't always going to be easy, cheesy, peasy. But you're going to have a comfort in your heart knowing what God's doing. So here's what happened with Paul. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequent, in deaths often. This is what Paul said. He said, you guys are talking about the great things in your life. He said, but I want to talk to you about the great things that happened in my life. That don't sound very good, does it? <laughs> but maybe, wait a minute, maybe we're going somewhere with this. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. That was their form of punishment. They would take the, stri the, the whip and they would smack them across the back and they would count the stripes of the whip. And then they would get 40 stripes for 39. Amen. So here's what we see. Thrice I've been beaten with rods. Amen. I, I, I have never been beaten with rods. Okay. I just want you to know that. Has anybody been beaten with rods? Because I want to testimony if you have. I know that I, I know that we took a couple baseball bats with us before, but I've never been beaten with it. I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned thrice and I suffered a shipwreck. A night and a day I have been deep in the deep. I've been in the ocean a night and a day. I've never been in the... i, I seen those videos here uh, a couple of years back. Those men that were out in the ocean and their boat had flipped in the delirium. They had only been out there 12 or 16 hours. The one guy. It's just amazing what happens. But this is what all the things that he had fought for the Lord. And journeys often in perils of water. In perils of robbers. And in perils of my own countrymen. His neighbors, his friends, causing him a hard time. He was he, all these things had fought against him in perils by the heathen, the people that were were the roughnecks. If he if he was the one that he was walking down the alley, they were all bad. He was the one that was going to get robbed. Just stick away from Paul. He was the one that was going to face him. He said, "In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren." Tough time because people that said they would be there for you, they weren't. That's right. He had been in those tough times. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often. In hunger and thirst and fastings often. In cold and neckiness. Listen, I don't want to be cold, much less naked. Come on, then I'm embarrassed and cold. I'm feeling bad. This man went through the in weariness and painfulness and watchings often. In hunger and thirst and fastings often. In cold and neckiness. When we get this picture in our mind of what he faced. But let's move on to verse 29. Go on over to 29 if you would. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I not burned on? He said they were complaining about the things that they would face in the Lord. But why was it so essential that Paul would face that? Because we know that Paul went on to write half 
the New Testament. It's easy to look at his trials and say, man, he went through some tough stuff. And I'm looking at you today and I'm saying, man, I know you've been through some tough stuff. But what book is God wanting to write through your faith? Think about that. What is God wanting to prove through your trial? Maybe a book that may going to minister to people, but it's going to minister to you. That God brought me through this trial. God brought me through this problem. God brought me through this thing. Let's go through Job. We can read Job and we can find in the book of Job, there's a laundry list of things that happened. He lost everything that he had. We understand that he lost all of it. But we understand in the saying that God had a plan and we still reference to Job today, the patience of Job. But whenever we go through, I want us to begin to give us three things today that I want you to look at. The first thing is this, is the advantage of your trials. What do we find are the advantage of your trials? We understand that Job, when it was all said and done, that Job had gained back twice the, the, the economy that he had, the property, everything, every possession that he had, Job had doubled. Have you ever thought about what's going to be doubled in your life when you allow God to bring you through the trial? Have you ever thought about the things that will be doubled in your life? What about this? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Just a short portion over from where we were at this right there. Chapter 12 and verse 6. We find that Paul, For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me. What does that mean? He said, when people look at me, they think, man, you really got it together. Man, you really got some awesome things going on in your life. Man, you are a great evangelist. Boy, you are educated. Some men just right here, boy, you really got it going on in your house. You really got it going on. You drive the nicest car. Man, you, you got this thing happening. They looked at him and thought he was somebody that had it all special. And he says, though, this very day, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I prepare, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. All these words were going out about Paul. Man, Paul's coming by. They knew who he was. For though, here's what it says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, all the things, man, he had these great things that God was doing in his life. You know how come he knew so much about God? Because he had lots of questions. Do you have any questions for God? Do you wonder if he can bring you through your trial? Do you wonder if he's hearing you? You wonder if he cares about your finances? You've got to be in a spot where God can prove himself for you to find out he cares about your finances. You want his revelations to open up. You want understanding of God. He goes on to say this. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Now, whether it was through action, we don't know what it was. Some people said it was I. Some people said it was this. I, I have to believe when you think about the messenger of Satan that maybe it was just simply every day he beat himself down. Maybe, he had a, maybe it was his self-esteem. Maybe it was guilt that he had from before that the enemy had tried to bring in his mind, but yet he had to pray to stay strong. We understand that through his brokenness, greatness came into his life. Of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh of the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to chase after me, to cause me problems, lest I should be exalted above measure. He knew that if he continued on, they would want to push him further. From this day, I besought the Lord Christ. He said, I prayed about it three times before the Lord. Lord, I, I'm coming. I'm God, I'm hungry. Why is this in my life? And the Lord would remove it not. He said, the Lord Christ, that it might depart from me. Go on to verse 9. Verse 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Yes. And sometimes we're asking God to take these problems out of our life, and God says, I'm not doing it. Because you don't understand. That's the only way I can make you pray. That's God doesn't make us pray. The only way, let me, let me rephrase it. The only way that I can get you at a spot where you want to talk to me is when you've got a trial in your life. The only way I can get you to ever settle down and humble, it, it, it'll, get you, it'll get you there. God, I'm not, I don't like disasters and tragedies. But America had never been so religious before the previous war as the day after 9-11. But now that the tragedy's gone, where are people at? And we want God to get into such a relationship with God where He doesn't have to bring a trial in our life. He says that back in Psalms. He says, I don't want you to be like a, a mule or a horse that I have to put a bit in your mouth to get you to obey. I want you to listen. But the problem is, is, is we got too many things in our life that keep us back from where He wants us to be. But let's, let's go on and read this. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in the infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let's go over to verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. What? You, you take pleasure when things come at you that, that make you sick, make you feel bad? When trials come, when you feel in love, when you feel that you've been hurt, you've had somebody turn their back on you, you've been shipwrecked, you've been beaten, you've been spat upon? And you 
take pleasure? Because here's what we got to understand. That this is for the perfecting of our faith in God. God loves you right now. Do you know that He's waiting on you to turn from that trial? Uh, we're we're going to come around and it's going to come, it's going to come big screen in just a minute. In reproaches and the necessities and persecutions, the distresses for Christ's sake, when I am weak, then am I strong. So what happens when we think we're strong? <laughs> anyway. Maybe you'll catch that later. Because if you're strong, I promise you, it won't be very long and you're going to find out how weak you really are. Though I mean nothing. Verse 12. Let's see. We, I'm, I'm going to skip past that. When we look at our trying and our persecution, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to bow to me. You're going to turn. We've heard the story of the three Hebrew boys. He wanted to be worshipped at a certain time of the day. They were going to fall down and worship. Well, they started this thing and they said, and, and they come along and they noticed these three boys. They said, we ain't turning. We ain't bowing. I don't care. You're, if you're going to work for my company, you're going to bow whenever whenever the, the alarm goes off. You're going to, you're going to bow to the boss of the Lord. <laughs> not going to do it. <laughs> you can do what you want to to me, but I'm not going to do it. And that's exactly what happened. What happened, though? The three Hebrew boys, they bound them up, put them up in a rope, and they threw them all off in there. And they got where they could see close enough, and they looked down in there, and they said, there's not three boys in there. There's four, and the one looks like the like son of man. They went through the trials. I don't want to be thrown in a fiery furnace. But let me tell you how you lose your bonds when you lose your ropes. is in the fire. Amen. They threw them in there bound up, but they were walking about freely. And do you understand what I'm trying to tell you today? When God sends that affliction to you, what He's wanting you to do, and when the devil staring you right in the face to get to such a place in confident faith, it doesn't matter what's facing me, that God's going to take care of me. It said this very thing, the Lord prepares a table for me before my enemies. Come on, the Lord is already looking out for you in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your problem, in the midst of the things you're facing. It seems improbable, that rock in the road. God's put it there in such a way to release you from that fear. How would you like to get where maybe you're scared to death today about a bill that you've got coming due? Maybe today you would like to be free of that. But what if I told you you had to face it dead on? God ain't going to move it a month in advance. God ain't going to move it two weeks in advance. God ain't going to send you nothing up. Hey, don't worry about it. I got you a ticket on the. But God says you just walk to that lane and you speak to it. You step into that situation and I'm going to take care of it as you step. See, he didn't go to the Red Sea before they got to it. He was when they got to it. And we look at our trials and say, God, why am I in this trial? And God said, I'm about to put some faith inside of you that you're not afraid of any trial. You're not afraid of anything. You don't need a drug to cure you. You don't need a bottle or an improper relationship to sue you. You just need me, and you're going to make it through. Endurance. 
patience. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wait until it comes. No, 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 no. Ask somebody that works out or trains for a marathon. Endurance is something to just about the long haul. It ain't about it. It's about making the race. And when God puts you in the trial, He's putting you there because He wants you to be able to stand and withhold in that day when things come. Oh, Lord, we're out here. We've been following you all this time. And we've got over 5,000 men, probably fifteen to 20,000 women and children total. All of us together, 20,000 people walking. Well, what are we going to do? The Lord said, well, and, and it's time to eat. He said, well, start looking at what you got. Here. They had a few fishes and some loaves. That little boy had. We don't have the money. You see what happened? The greatest miracle that ever happened in their life came because they didn't have what they needed. By what they bought. But God said, you got what you needed. I put you in a spot because there's going to become a time, apostles, where you're not going to have silver and gold. Come on, can you hear me? That happened in the book of Acts after this experience. That you're not going to have what you need. You're not going to have silver and gold. You're going to have a temple and a God to serve. But you ain't going to have... But I'm going to, because I'm going to put you in such a spot where you're going to know that I'm going to provide for you. And what I'm talking about today, I know there's a lot of different things in right now maybe going... I want you to think about your own situation. God's got us... I can come down and I can walk through your living rooms if you want me to right now, but I'm not going to take that time. I want you to think about your own things going on in your life. The things that you're facing right now, could it possibly be that a God, a Heavenly Father that loves us, how many of us are perfect in patience? I don't see any hands, okay? And I didn't think I would. That's why I sped on. Because, listen, we all are at a place where God's got to work. But if we agree we want God to perfect our faith, then we must agree that we want trials in our life. Well, okay. I was hoping that we would be excited. Because that's the heart of the message today. That when your trials come, it's because God loves us and He wants you to know how much He cares about you. It's never seen until you get to that spot. It's never seen until we get to that place. It's never seen until we get there and suffer in Christ. Why did He go to the cross? See, there was a victory in it. Why did He suffer? Because in the end, He could have the people that He wanted. You and I, amen. He can have that through that very thing. Take it to Philippians chapter 1, verse 28. Amen. And nothing terrified by your adverse adversaries. He was speaking to them about the faith that he wanted them to have. To be in such a place that no adversary that would come against them would terrify them. Which is to them an evident token of perdition. Which means that they, they were, to them it was a thing that they were going to, that, that you wouldn't write. So an, an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Take it to verse 29. Here's what I want us to focus on. Verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And guess what? If we're to be ministers and missionaries into this world, how does it happen? Through our suffering. How else is He going to prove His faithfulness in it? Through our suffering. Zacchaeus came not because of his own healing. He came because he heard of the healings that were happening in his lives. But too many times we're ready to quit, get reset, and start all over. And God says, wait a minute, I've got you in the middle of a trial because I want to build something in your life. And people are watching. God's put people there to watch in our life to see where we're at. But here's the phrase, and I'm, I'm, I'm coming around quickly. Here's what I want us to think about. Today I simply titled it this very day. Nothing to lose. But when do you have nothing to lose? When you've lost it all. Giving up everything in your life, and you say, God, it's yours. Whatever happens with it, it's yours. I get tired of this struggle and this work. Why does it upset you so bad? Is it because you're still you're playing God and you've got your hand in it? It should have worked out this way, or it should have worked out. This way. I thought you gave that to God. Well, I got real quiet. You're not turn the air conditioner down. I'm here, everybody. Sometimes we're picking up our problems. See, when we get to a place where we've lost it all, that's only because you listen. You've got nothing to lose when you've lost it all. And here's the problem. Many times people are in the... They've ch chased it. They're, in, they're lonely. They're hungry. They're, they're hurt. They're painful. They've chased it at the end of a, of a needle. They've chased it at the end of a line that they've stored in. They've chased it at the end of that relationship. They've chased it at, in, in, a, in a novel they've got lost in. In this thing, they've chased it at the end of, uh, of whatever habit and hobby. They've chased it at the, that, at the end of all those very things. And they still came up empty and broken. Because let me tell you, whatever you've lost it all, that's the perfect place to be at. Because that's what God builds on when you're broken. When you're broken. He doesn't look for a foundation to build on. 
I'm a really good speaker. I talk great in front of people. I, I really look good. I, I, I really communicate with people. Listen, you've already got too much of your own structure left over. And, and, and here's the problem. When those things get in the way, I can assure you it won't be too long until he begins to pull some of them down. Whenever we've still got some things to hold on to, well, I, I, I've not lost at all. I, I mean, I've lost a lot, but I haven't lost it. Don't worry. Because that, that's what it takes to get you to lose it all. You understand what I'm talking about, losing it all? Let go of every situation and say, Lord, you're in control of it. That's when we lose it all. It's no longer mine. You understand that? I have nothing. I came into this world broken, naked, and that's how I leave this world. With nothing. And guess what? The quicker I can get to that in this life, realizing that every situation and trial that I face is because of Him, for His glory, it helps me out there. See, whenever we come to a place in life where we have nothing to turn to, sometimes troubles start coming. And what do we do to turn to? All you're doing is revealing that to the Lord. That's something else that He's going to have to shake in your life. Amen. We cling to our finances. Don't worry. Don't cling to them because that's what's going to shake next. Right. Don't cling to that car because that's what's going to shake next. Don't cling, don't cling to this person because that's what's going to shake next. Don't cling to this thing because that's what's going to shake next. But it's whenever we come to the place where we have nothing. So today, I ask you in this service, are you at a place where you have nothing? Because if you're at that spot, then you're right where God wants you. Because He can work with your life. He says, I know that whenever God builds on this, I'm going to get the glory for it. Amen. What happens is no more hindrances in our life. Sometimes where God's pulling us this way, and we're grabbing a hold of, as again, cars, houses, finances, bottles, relationships, internet, pornography, whatever it is, we're grabbing a hold of it. Eventually He chops that away. And this falls apart. And that falls apart, finally you look and you say, what am I going to do? I guess I might as well go with it. And it's not in a bad way. Why does he do it? It's kind of like a kid. You're whipping them because you don't want them grabbing that thing that they're going to choke on. They're screaming and hollering at you, and they're going to choke on whatever they've got in their mouth if you don't pull it from them. <coughs> and sometimes when God pulls things in our life that stand in between us and the perfecting of our faith, we get tight. God, don't pull that. Don't do that. That hurts me. But don't let anything stand between us and Him. Amen. I want to tell you that today, speaking, and I wrap up on this. Personally, I've been through some things in my life that God has brought me through. And as many words as I can say it without being too plain, when I was molested as a child, that took away every value that I had in life. I am not even good enough for anything in life. Why in the world does this happen to me? Why can't I be like a normal kid? Why do I have to have that going through my life? I never walked through life with great value and said, man, I'm this and I'm that. But I began to see that God was preparing me to a place where I had nothing left. Pastor, are you telling me that God put that in your life to happen? Listen, God had a way that allowed me to be broken in the exact same way for you to be broken. Just the same as this happened to me. Somebody was on the other end of that and did that to you. Guess what they had to realize? I have a problem. You understand that? What it helped me to do is set me free in life. You can come up here and punch me in the nose right now and it wouldn't matter to me. Because I realize no matter what you do to this flesh, it doesn't matter what happens to my soul. What did it take for me to get to that place? As an eight or nine year old, to have a gun held in my life, head, head, but you know what? None of this stuff in life matters to me anyway. Not for my own hand. Somebody else held a gun in my hand. At that age. Well, you know what it did? It brought me to a place where I had nothing left. Not even this flesh of mine to say it. To be beat, to be hit on. Those things that didn't matter. Guess what? You can no longer wound me through my flesh. But you can't touch what God's given me inside. No matter what you can do. You can do on me. You talk about me. You can't wound what's on the inside right here. You can't wound the faith that I have in God. What, what, what you can't wound me watching things as I grow up. Watching things happen and we go through life and God begins to bring us to a place where we have nothing left. There, there's nothing to lose. When we get, and let me tell you, when somebody gets to a place where they've got nothing to lose, I'm holding on to nothing. Everything's broke apart. Sometimes when we hit the bottom of the barrel, that's perfect because we've got nothing to hold on to. And when I get to that spot, then I realize that, wait a minute, that none of this stuff really matters. It's still inside. I've got a heart of God. And He loves me and He reaches me. You can do all kinds of things that are going to happen in the flesh. Watch it. But I'm not trying to make a sad story today. I'm being real with you. But why it doesn't matter to me. Why it doesn't matter to me what happens in life. I'm going to be okay. God's going to take care of me. Watching my mom get beat up being the woman that she, she's not a small woman. Getting slung across the room. Blood across the What I learned is this. You can do what you want to the flesh. But you don't take away my security in God. You don't take away that I know that I'm going to be alright. Man, I'm not going to do that. God gave me a wonderful wife. 
having some rough, some rough roads before we got married. Like we had a great marriage, but going through the different things that happened. And I wanted to be the great dad I didn't have. I, I went out and we got this house and we, we got this car and, and, and things. And we were, we were living the dream. I was working in the church all the time, full time busy. Then all of a sudden, the economy turns down. I got laid off every other week. We didn't get no more overtime. I told you I had to go for closure. I lost everything that I had. Why? Because I started building my hopes and dreams and living the American dream. That's why I tell you the American dream is an eternal nightmare. That house, if you let that become between you and God, it will drive you straight to hell. I'm not being mean to you. I'm being real with you. That car will drive you straight to hell. Why? Not, not because the car is bad, but because we let it get in the place of our God. We let it stand where God wants us to be. We Here's what I want you to understand. Money means nothing. It's going to come and go, and it means nothing in eternity. Do you understand that? That the money that we work so hard, that money, that money will mean nothing. You're just asking all my life chasing that, and it means nothing? You're going to tell me I spent all my life worried about this and this and this, and it means nothing? That God don't give one iota about it, other than the fact that you honor Him in it? Amen. And God had to strip me down, and I felt so naked and exposed. I felt like I had nothing. What we understand is through the working of our patience. Come on. Being tried in those areas where we need our faith. God, I need to trust you. That it doesn't matter what I have. That I'm still, I can still be a good dad. Whether whether I'm living in a beat up, ran down place that, that ain't got nothing left. Whether I'm driving in a car that's got three flats. Whether I'm driving in a car that costs more to fill up than the car's worth. Whether I'm driving in, it, it doesn't matter. Because inside I can have a hope and a faith. What I'm talking about is this very thing. When we get to a place where we've got nothing to lose, that's when God moves in. The sad thing is, is too many times we have to lose everything to get to a place where we have nothing to lose. I'm crying out as a pastor today saying this thing. Make sure that your walk with God is first and foremost. Don't let Him take away houses. Don't let Him take away jobs. Don't let Him take away houses. Listen, somebody could stand up in here today and say, Pastor, I hate you, and I'm never coming back, and everybody else could stand up, and my faith would not be shaken. Why? Because when I was younger, I was in a church service, and somebody got mad at the pastor, and they stood, one person stood up, and another person stood up, and they called out. Well, what I watch is how God masterfully, with a mighty hand, took that man of God and protected him, and he sent those people out. What am I telling you?
yourself and everything that you have. It's because I love you. Mm. Yeah. 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 My final thought was here in Mark chapter 5, verse 25 through 30. Very interesting story of a woman. The well. Or not the woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood. Mark 5 and 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood, 12 years, who was one of her, had suffered many things of many physicians, had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. But rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came, came into the. And, came in and pressed behind him. Whenever she heard he was there, she came in behind him and touched his garment. And a couple other of, of the other synoptic gospels who record this as well. One says, touched the hem of his garment, which is significant. Where she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. We understood the, the, the story that had happened. As soon as she touched the Lord, she realized it was all gone. Today, I want to tell you, you're going to realize that maybe you may look in the mirror, and for the day in your fight, in that fight, you may look in the mirror and say, I don't see it yet. But in your heart, you know it's done. Amen. You know it's settled. You may look today at your situation and still see it, but it's about looking in the mirror, and it ain't about what you see. You walk by faith and not by faith. <laughs> you have realized the situation. But you notice that when you go back, take me back to the verse, verse 26. Oh, I'm straight. Okay, take me to verse 26. And had suffered many things of many positions. Many doctors had come to her and talked to her and done things and tried to help her out. Nothing worked. For many years she lived a life that was tormented, a life that was not comfortable. She had a bleeding ailment and she had to, she had to be she was considered unclean amongst people. But she came to a place that she knew that if I step out into the crowd of people, they're gonna look down on me. They're gonna say that she's un I'm unclean. They're gonna do all these things. She knew this. They're going to know what I've done in town. They're going to know the lifestyle I live. If I go around them church folks, if I go there, if I get around them, they're going to know my background. But it finally comes to a place that she spent all that she had. It was nothing better. Notice what it says. She spent all that she had had. I believe she had sold the house. I believe she had went through everything that she had. She wanted life. And she tried everything. And the only way that she could reach that life was one day she heard that this Savior was coming through. If there's any way at all, I can just get out amongst these people. I don't care if they ridicule me. I don't care if they say they push me to the side. I don't care if they look over me, they spit on me. I've only got one shot. You know why? Because she had something at this point that was her advantage. The best thing that she had was that she had nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. Listen, if I don't make it to him today, I'm going to die anyway. And what I'm going to tell you is many times the devil tells you, you can't leave this lifestyle. You can't leave these friends. You can't leave this lifestyle. You can't leave this child. But in the whole time, you're dying in the midst of it. He says, but if you'll come to the lake, the place to push through. What I want you to hear today is just amazing. She did. She heard that Jesus was there. And you've been looking for a word of hope in your life. I'm speaking across this place today. This is If you'll close your eyes with me. Your head bowed. Some of you have been waiting for a word of hope. You've been waiting for a word of hope. I'm telling you today that God knows your situation. He's working in it and He's here today. The kingdom of heaven is at this place to heal the sick. Come on, to raise the dead. I believe He's here today. Come on, to give strength to the lame and the blind. He wants to reach into your life today. And you've heard those words. The second thing was this, is that whenever she heard it, she made a move. The next thing is that she came in, she followed it behind you when she heard that. And today maybe you've heard that God's been moving. Maybe you wanted to know if God's been moving. And so you made your move in today. But there's something that we quickly sped past and I want you to see. To start today, You've got, to, you've got to take me down to verse 27, I believe it is. To start moving closer today. 28, let me 28. Here's what it is, here's what I want you to do. In this world, when we look at people and they talk to themselves, come on, when they talk to themselves, we think they're crazy and they're weird. But this day, this lady talked to herself. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. One says, but if I would touch the hem of his garment. And today, what I'm telling you is this very thing. If you'll begin to speak it in your own mind. If I will really live for God and give him my everything. If I can just really get a hold, get a good touch of God, I'll be able to walk away from this addiction. 
I'll be able to walk away from this pornography addiction. I'll be able to walk away from this uh, this uh, affair. I'll be able to walk away from, from bad thoughts, perverse thoughts. I'll be able to walk away from my pride. I'll be able to walk away from the things, that, the lust of money, the lust of things, the, the judgmental attitude. I'll be able to walk away. If I can just touch the hem of his garment and get them touched today. But if you ain't broken yet, if you're not miserable with the things going on in your life, you're not going to make that move today. Don't worry, come back in a couple months and you might be there. I'm asking you today to make a move in your life. I'm ready for some of you to start talking to yourself and say, wait a minute, I've got to step forward. I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of walking this way. I'm tired of doing those things. I need to step forward. Our strength that we find in Jesus comes from this very thing. You can open your eyes for a minute. This takes part of today, the slide that I had. Something I want you to see in the slide today. It's kind of hard to see from a different distance. But what is it that gives you strength in life? You find that in the life of Christ, there's something that we realize that is true beauty. The way that you get there, you may say, Pastor, I've got nothing. My life is dead. Listen, I'm dying. Here's what God needs you to do. He needs you to die out to the things of your own self. What is that called? It's called repentance. Listen, I'm tired of living that way. I'm tired. I, man, I'm tired of waking up all on, on Saturday morning, Sunday morning, feeling terrible. I'm tired of, uh, man, as soon as I get off work, I've got to have a fix. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of battling in myself. Listen, whenever you're at that place to let go of it, that's what we call dying out. That's repentance. Christ died for our sins. But what do we understand? There's something that we call the burial. He died. We understand that he was put in the tomb. Right? What is that called? That's called the burial. What's going to happen today? We're going to be baptizing my sister. We're going to be baptizing. You die out. You get buried. And then what does it go on? You find that the, the and feeling God's spirit and power inside of you. You come alive again. He says that I that I might might be dead, but Christ might not live within me. It's not it's not I, but it's Christ that lives within me. If you're wanting to conquer that problem, the problem is, is many times we're trying to go along and we're trying to run something that's got to have three plugs on some on a two plug hole. You may have even repented and been baptized, but it's about being filled with that Holy Ghost. It's about being filled with that power, my friend. You've been brought down to broken and dead in your situation. Why? Because that's exactly where we start with Christ. Amen. Today, if you're at a place, you said, Pastor, I've got nothing to lose. Then I encourage you, you're at the starting place with God. Amen. When we get to that place, God says, guess what? I'm ready to start building your life. Amen. But it may require you to let go of some things you've been holding on to for dear, for dear life. God's got a plan for us. If you'll stand with me. I'm going to read these scriptures for you. Bring them up with Sister Davis as we stand. Romans 6 and 2. For God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He's talking about those that had repented. They were dead to sin, dying out. Verse 3 goes on to tell us this. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? So now we understand that they were dead. Now burial always follows. When you die out to repentance, it's not enough to say, God, I don't want to live that way. But guess what? You don't ever want to see that old man again. Why don't you bury him in the blood of Jesus through his baptism? Amen. Then he goes on to say this. In the death, death that life as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Whenever we find it says repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ with the remission of your sins, and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is what gives us power. See, you're saying, man, I feel like everything's falling apart. Maybe there's a reason why. Because God wants to take you down to that place of repentance where that you can begin a new life full of joy. Come on. Amen. Amen. We're going to get ready. What I want us to do, I want us to take just a couple of moments. I know with the time that some of us go, and we're getting ready to do a baptism in just a moment. We're going to, we're going to get this all set up here. Sister Barrett, maybe uh, I'll, I'll go back with you guys in just a second. Brother Barrett, lead us in this worship song, and uh, we'll get it all set up. Here's what I want us to do. Can we just, I'm going to fill out the spirit a little. Let's just take a moment. Let's can we close our eyes all across this place for a moment. Every eye closed and nobody looking around. 
How many today would be willing to raise their hand with nobody looking? I'm going to be the only one looking. If you're looking around, shame on you. But would be willing to say, Pastor, I realize my situation is dead right now. How many will be willing to raise their hand? Amen. Thank you for your honesty. How many today realize their situation is dead? And even across this place are willing to say, I need some new life brought back into it. Amen. Right now, what I want us to do, thank you for your honesty all across this place, many hands raised. How many are willing to, for that urgency, realizing that you've got nothing to lose, will call out to God and that very thing all across this place, whether you know how to pray, whether you've never prayed before. Will you do this in honor just today to give unity in the Lord? Just raise up your hands toward heaven. If you don't feel comfortable, I understand that. But today, all across this place, everybody that's in here that, that can raise your hand, is able in body, especially if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Can we raise our hands toward heaven right now? Well, all across this place, I want us just to begin to call out to it right now. We're getting ready. We're going to do this other stuff. But this is, a, this is important right now, church. This is what we came for today, that we will leave different. I believe that right now, you will say in your mind and in your heart, Lord, God, for right now, First off, we must have that repentance. If we've been out and we've done some things we shouldn't, we need to have that time of repentance before the Lord. But then we need at that point say, God, I don't ever want to go back. See, that's what repentance is. It's not only forgiveness of sins, but it's a turning around and then asking God to refill you with His presence and His Spirit again. Can we pray that for just a moment, Lord? All across this place, however you know how to talk to God, maybe if you're comfortable, reach your hand out to a neighbor right now. Lord, right now, in this place, God, do you see how many of your children have come today? Lord, the word that you have given, have given has been delivered today. Lord, your desire is not to condemn, but to lift up. Today, God, we have seen the awareness of our situation. We have seen the importance of who you are. God, and today there's so many people here that just need to know you love them, God. Right now, if you come on, church, you can go call out to him for just a moment. Can we call out to him for just a moment? I, I, you, you know how God's been dealing with you. I can't tell you today. But if God's been dealing with you today, can we call out to Him for just a moment? Nobody being embarrassed. Remember, that's part of nothing to lose. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody says. She didn't mind pushing through the crowd because she knew that it was in. It was the end if she didn't. And some of you will feel like I'm at the end today. God, in your name, I'm praying right now. Come on, if you, can we just reach our hand out to a neighbor? Come on, reach your hand out to a neighbor right now. We're going to pray right now all across this place. Lord, right now, touch these lives. Lord, those that are just now discovering who you are. Lord, I pray that they feel your presence. They know that you're a friend right now. God, they feel something they can't explain right now. Come on, let the hand Jacob and me and just begin to surround us right now in this place. Those that have got worry and doubt and fear, God. Lord, and you're, they're at a place where nothing's worth. God, I pray that they reach to you right now. Come on, I pray that households are fixed right now. Come on, that marriages are strengthened right now. Come on, that addictions are being chains are being broken right now, God. Come on, that new life is being given right now. Oh, God, in this place, we need your move in this house today. God, we need that move, that real touch. God, we're not playing church today. God, we are not about sometime. God, we are not here about Real today, church. If you would like, anyone would like to come to this altar and pray, this altar is open right now. Come on, if anyone would like to come today, come on, maybe you've got a friend that you know is struggling. Take that friend by the hand. Say, come on, today has got to be that day. Come on, maybe you've got somebody to talk to you about it before church. Say, I've got to have a change. Come on, today is that day, church. I'm telling you. Oh, Lord, I don't want to get somebody to come with the sisters. Come up with us today, God. I pray with these that are in the altar right now. I believe that the Lord is working in this house. But I believe there's some lives that God is rebuilding, the faith that God is building up in right now. We're going to sing this one more time. service today.
shame. But today, maybe you're in your seat praying right now. God loves you. God cares about you. God is working in your situation. God is working in your situation. And I promise you this thing. I promise you don't give up on it. Don't step away from it. I can be. This is a place in the house. 